Uh, it is good to be in the house of the Lord, uh, and it's good to see one another, uh, to be able to worship one in, uh, with God together. Uh, this morning is our call to worship. I would like to read Psalm 96. Psalm 96. Sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord, praise his name, proclaim his salvation day after day, declare his glories among the nations, his marvelous deeds among all the peoples. For great is the Lord and most worthy of our praise. He is to be feared above all gods. For all the gods of the nations are merely idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Splendor and majesty are before him. Strength and glory are in his sanctuary. Ascribe to the Lord, O families of the nations. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord glory that is due his name. Bring an offering and come into his courts. Worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. Tremble before him and his holiness. Say among the nations, the Lord reigns. The Lord is firmly established. It cannot be moved. He will judge the people with equity. Let the heavens rejoice. Let the earth be glad. Let the sea resound and all that is in it. Let the fields be jubilant and everything in them. Then the trees of the forest will sing for joy. Then they will sing before the Lord, for he comes. He comes to judge the earth. He will judge the world with righteousness and the peoples with his truth. Let's pray. Father, it is good to come into the house of the Lord, and it is good to sing praises to you, to sing to the King of all. But it is very true that this morning, there are people in parts of this world that cannot worship like we can do. They cannot gather in the house of the Lord where they're familiar with worshiping because of war, because of disease, because of pestilence, because of fear. There are some that have had their homes blown up in the last few hours. The places that they called secure and called safe, that their children came home to to find a place of refuge. And it's not there anymore. And oh God, we do not know the truth for the lies that we're being told all over the world about what is right, what is not right. This is the way you should go. That is the way you should go. And yet God, you want worshipers who worship you in spirit and in truth. So we know, oh God, not just by faith, but we know because we've experienced it, that your word is truth, oh God. Today, let us hear from your word. Today, use your servant to speak clearly. Today, Holy Spirit, soften our hearts to receive what we have to hear from you. And we will trust you. So God, I ask right now that as we worship you, that we would do that in spirit and in truth, that we would lift our song to you because you are holy and you are good. We bring ourselves before you in the name of Jesus. Amen. I'm going to invite you to stand together as we sing. We're going to sing two songs together.
we will sing it.
standing for just a moment. I know that our song didn't work well, um, but I'm not going to let that stop us from worship. Uh, it gets really discouraging for me as a pastor when that happens and when things fall down, but I'm not going to let that happen. So we're going to sing without any instrument, without anything else. We're going to sing How Great Thou Art. One verse, one chorus. O Lord my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the words thy hands have made, I hear the stars, I hear the rolling thunder, thy power throughout the universe displayed. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. Jeff, you may be seated. Our scripture reading today is from uh, John chapter 6, verses 1 through 14. Some time after this, Jesus crossed to the far shore of the Sea of Galilee, that is, the Sea of Tiberias. And a great crowd of people followed him because they saw the signs he had performed by healing the sick. Then Jesus went up on a mountainside and sat down with his disciples, the Jewish Passover festival was near. Coming toward him, he said to Philip, where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? He asked this only to test him, for he already had in mind what he was going to do. Philip answered him, it would take more than a half, of, half a year's wages to buy enough bread for each one to have a bite. Another of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up. Here is a boy with five small barley loaves and two small fish. but how far will they go among so many? Jesus said, have the people sit down. There was plenty of grass in that place and they sat down, about 5,000 men were there. Jesus then took the loaves, gave thanks and distributed to those who were seated as much as they wanted. He did the same with the fish. When they had all had enough to eat, he said to his disciples, gather the pieces that are left over, let nothing be wasted. So they gathered them and filled 12 baskets with the pieces of the five barley loaves left over by those who had eaten. After the people saw the sign Jesus performed, they began to say, surely this is the prophet who is to come into the world. The reading of God's word. We're gonna watch a video in just a second. Um, in preparation for a time that we would normally have of giving our offerings. Hopefully within the next couple of weeks, we're gonna be able to have offering plates again and ushers and we'll be able to pass that around. Uh, um, and be able to do that. Do that. I keep turning my mic off. Um, if you'd like to, uh, to be able to give and to support the ongoing ministry here at Christian Baptist Church, uh, you can do that through online giving, uh, where you could go to our website, christianbaptist.ca, and you can see a link that will take you to, be, uh, to the directions on how to do that. You can also give your offerings through the front door, uh, not the regular office door, but the front door. There's a mail slot. 
you can put that into. You can put that in an envelope with your name on it, Ministry of the Church. Watch the video that we're about to show here on the screen. On the screen. Sometimes it's hard finding thankfulness. With all the struggles, the visions, the anger, all. often hidden deep within us. Too often life begins to drain the joy, distress, destroy the deafening noise, shuts out the voice of God. We walk our road, we wander our path, setting the tone, watching our steps right and left, every breath spent, longing for the next. big thing. But what if we could give thanks in the little things, the small victories, the tiniest dreams that seem to feed our soul? The moments with the promise of God to never leave or move on to care and to love becomes Shall you pray with me, please? Heavenly Father, we, um, we truly do have so much to be thankful for and forgive us for taking so much for granted. Lord, we are a blessed people and um, a blessed country. And I thank you for that. And I pray, Heavenly Father, as we give of our tithes and offerings that you will continue to help us to, to want to give back, to do our part. Um, to show the love to others, to show your love to others. Thank you so much for this day. Thank you for this service. And I commit it to you. Amen. Thank you, Donna. Questions. Life's full of them, right? Do you like Pepsi or do you like Coke? Show of hands, Pepsi. Coke. Okay, Coke people are wrong. <laughs> Truth of the matter is I prefer ginger ale too. <laughs> Hot or mild? Hot or mild? Yeah, I'm a spicy guy. These are questions, right? They seem to be big at times. And sometimes going out to a restaurant. Oh, yeah, this was many years ago, it seems. But going out to a restaurant with people and the waitress would come to you and say, would you like that um, hot, medium, extra hot, extra medium? And they're questions. And we face them all the time. And little questions like that, they don't... 
really trouble us, although some people let, there are bigger questions. Bigger questions for us to face. Like what career will we go into when we get out of school? How about who will we marry? How about how much will I need to retire? How about will I ever be able to afford a home? And these two are important questions, and they're big questions. We all face them every single day. But there is a way bigger question for us to answer today. It's a question that was asked 2,000 years ago by a carpenter from Galilee. And that question is just as poignant then as it is today. We find the question in Matthew chapter 16, verses 13 to 14, and it says this. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do you say the Son of Man is? And they replied, some say John the Baptist, others Elijah, and still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. But what about you? Jesus gets intensely personal. But what about you, Jesus asked? Who do you say that I am? I believe that as we look towards our 200-year anniversary and as we look uh, at the situation in the world today, right here in Canada, but also, and in particular, Ukraine and Eastern Europe, it's one of the most important questions that we'll ever have to answer. So why was that such an important question? Because in the Bible, people who knew Jesus and who knew who he was got out of a boat and walked on water. They overcame fear. They overcame doubt. They overcame sin. They even overcame worry. They became new creations, according to the Bible. They lived bold lives, prayed big prayers, took huge risks, and accomplished much for the kingdom of God. So I'm asking you this question this morning. Who is Jesus? He is not some unity way over there. Jesus is full of life, dripping with emotion. Today, I want to talk about one of the miracles of Jesus and understand what it means for us to cooperate with God in these confusing times. And as we look towards our 200-year ministry here on Main Street, I want you to remember this one truth. He is still a miracle-working God. God. What are some of the miracles that Bible did, that Jesus did in the Bible? Name them out. Turned water into wine. Fed the 5,000, yeah. He raised the dead. Gee, that's just a little one. Yeah, absolutely. Cleanse the leper. Walked on water. Cast out demons. Oh, and the greatest of all, forgiveness. So I wrote a few down. He healed the lame, cleansed the lepers, fed the hungry, cast out demons, opened blind eyes and ears, walked on water, turned water into wine, calmed violent storms, and raised the dead. Why did Jesus do miracles? I mean, did he have to do that? He was God, right? But John 10, verses 37 to 40, Jesus said this. He said, do not believe me unless I carry out my father's work. But if I do his work, believe in the evidence of the miracles and the miraculous works that I've done, even if you don't believe my words. Then you will know and understand that the father is in me and I am in the father. Today, we're going to look at just one of the miracles, the miracle that Jeff wrote, read the story of. It's a miracle that is only found in all four Gospels. It's the only miracle. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. It's called the feeding of the 5,000, or at least that's the caption that most of us have. But if you want to be technical, there were a whole 
lot more than 5,000 people there, teacher, without having their wives with them. And if their wives came with them, they didn't have babysitters. They didn't call up 1-800-BABYSIT. That actually works. <laughs> That's scary. <laughs> So if you want to copyright that, you're welcome to do that today. But they didn't. So they probably had a child or two children or maybe more. So let's just guess and say there were maybe 15,000 people, men, women, children. And Jesus is going to take one boy's bag lunch and feed every one of them. See, there's something that we need to know, we need to understand right up front as we look at this. Jesus never once did a miracle to show off. He never did a miracle to gain puffed up stuff for himself. He always did miracles to teach something. They were always to teach. And someday, we're all going to need a miracle. Maybe some of you, some of me, are facing issues right now that we could sure use a miracle. And maybe it's a whole lot bigger than just missing one meal. Listen, if we want the living God to do a miracle in our life today, in our family, in our church, then we need to listen up because we need to figure out how to cooperate with Jesus and see him alive in this church today. I'm going to be preaching primarily out of Luke's gospel for this, and Mark chapter 6 is where it's recorded. Mark 6, verses 24 to 27 says, Jesus saw the huge crowd because they were like sheep without a shepherd. I want you to note one thing. I've said this before, but for those of you who haven't heard it or it just slipped by before, the word compassion is never used of any other person in all of Scripture other than God or Jesus. Never used for anyone else. And it says here, he saw the people and he had compassion on them. Maybe he sees you today. And if he does. He has compassion. He said that they looked like sheep without a shepherd. So he began teaching them many things. things. Late into the afternoon, his disciples came to him and said, this is a remote place and it's already getting late. Send the crowds away so they can go and buy it near bar <laughs> nearby farms and villages and buy something for them to eat. But Jesus said to them, you feed them. With what, they asked. We'd have to work many months to earn enough money to buy the food for all of these people. Okay, so there was a really big problem. And if you don't think of, if you don't think there's a really big problem, try to feed your own family when the fridge isn't very full. Try to feed the unexpected guest of 10 or 15 people that show up in your backyard because your kids happen to be inviting someone over and you get a crowd. Okay, go back two years or maybe forward a couple of months. It was a big problem. Thousands of people had been out in the desert or in the wilderness. It said there was lots of grass there, so it probably wasn't a desert. But they'd been out in this wilderness all day long, listening to Jesus speak. The hot air, the hot sun. And as the day wears on, you start to get a little bit hungry. And remember, there's no Christian chicken anywhere in sight. There's no Tim Hortons to grab a few Tim bits. And yet there's 15,000 hungry people. I call that a bit of a problem. Listen, if you have a problem and you need a miracle, you're going to have to discover this. And it's beautiful that this passage talks about it. There are four actions. That Jesus demonstrates for the disciples. Four actions if we need to see a miracle happen in our life. They're all part of this story. The first action that we need to take is that we need to admit that we have a need to God. Well, that's not an easy thing for us to do. Because most of us don't want to admit that we have a problem. We don't like to admit that we have a need. Because when we go and do that, we make ourselves really vulnerable, don't we? In fact, it's a, it's a matter of 
pride. But that's where we begin. And if you want God to work in your life, we've got to be able to admit that we have a need. God, I need your help. I can't do this on my own. The river is too wide. The mountain is too high. The job is too big. The problem is, for many of us, admitting our need to anyone is not easy. We'd rather hide our problems or blame our problems on other people or run away from them, pretending that they don't exist. So to be honest, what's going on in your life today? What's going on in my life today? At work, at home, your life that you don't want to admit is a problem, but you know it is. Listen, God doesn't work in our life until we're ready to ask him for help. Matthew 6, 7, and 8. Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks, Jesus said, receives Everyone who seeks, finds. And the door will be open to those who knock. knock. When there's a problem in our life, we need to come to Jesus. We need to say, Jesus, I need your help. Listen, if this is what we're supposed to do, then why don't we do it? Seriously, if we have a need, why is it that we hold on to these things and we don't tell anybody? Instead of admitting our our situation, admitting, telling the truth. Boy, there's an ugly word right now. And bringing our need to God. We tend to procrastinate. We put things off. We try to pass the buck on somebody else. The disciples were doing exactly that thing. The disciples procrastinated. That was the first thing they did. They knew the need, but they procrastinated. Listen, do you think that if they had been out there all day long, that maybe one of them didn't get a little bit of stomach pangs? One of them may have gotten a little bit hungry. These people. Jesus just keeps going on and on and on. It's kind of like sitting in a Sunday morning service and Andrew just keeps going on and on and on. Thank you, brother. Lord, I have a problem. (laughs) But they put off dealing with the problem. And Mark... says by this time it was very late in the day so i've got to ask you is it late in the day for you is it late in the day for your problem see it didn't take a genius to figure out that the people were going to get hungry and when the day got on that late it wasn't it wouldn't take anyone really smart no rocket scientist to figure this out think about it it seems obvious that this is going to happen but the disciples did nothing have you ever done that with your problems and you delayed Okay, maybe this is just for me, okay? So work with me. Enjoy the time. I've procrastinated. I've even pretended that the problem doesn't exist or that maybe it really isn't that bad. But the truth is procrastination almost always makes a problem worse. Procrastination never solves the problem and at times it makes things even worse. Not only did they procrastinate, they tried to pass the buck. Look at what they said. They said, hey, Jesus, send the people away. You send the people away. After all, they came to listen to you. You've got the mic. I didn't invite these people here. You were the one who had compassion on them. It's your responsibility, not ours, to feed them. Tell them to go away. Have you ever done that? You see, we say it's not my fault, it's society's fault. It's the environment's fault. It's the government's fault. It's Putin's fault. We pass the buck all the time. 
We blame other things and other people. The problem is when we pass the buck, we miss out on the miracle that God is wanting to do with the buck we passed off. The third thing is the disciples worried about their problem. Listen, I think if we prayed about our problems as much as we worried about them, we'd have a lot less things to worry about. But we fret, we stew, we get upset stomachs, we worry and get anxious and stressed out. And we're in good company. When Jesus told the disciples to feed the crowd, Jesus turned back to, or sorry, they, when Jesus told the disciples to feed the crowd, the disciples turned back to Jesus and said, with what? Like, we'd have to work for months to be able to pay for the amount of food that these hogs are going to eat. See, the disciples did a little bit of cost calculation. And as the Digits kept getting more and more and more. Their anxiety went to overdrive again and again and again. And I can just imagine someone like Peter and some of the other guys saying, hey, Jesus, listen, how are we going to feed them? There's 15,000 people here. We did a head count. How are you going to get the money? How are we going to get the money? Where is our debit card? Do you have a better debit card? See, my debit card only has a $1,000 limit, and that isn't going to touch these. And besides, who's going to clean up the mess? Stop. You see, for all the looking, they couldn't see one really important thing. Who was with them that day? Yes. Jesus was right with them. And the more challenging our circumstance, the greater the opportunity that God has to show himself revealed to us with new life. And when life is overwhelming, when our circumstances seem to be more than we can handle, it provides the context for us to experience something even better with God. Don't miss out on what's going on here. While the disciples are procrastinating, while they're putting stuff off and worrying about trying to feed the crowds, they're standing right next to Jesus, you know, the guy who just did these little things like give sight to the blind, hearing to the deaf, cleanse the leper, and raise the dead. He made the universe at his command. Think about it. Jesus is standing right there, right beside. Item and the Jesus and the disciples, sorry, are looking for their debit cards. So I have a question. What do you do when you have a problem? Jesus is right beside you. In fact, according to Romans 8 11, the scriptures say this it says, The Spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you. And just as God raised Jesus Christ from the dead, he will give you life to your mortal bodies by the same spirit living inside of you. Yes, Jesus lives in you. How does that make you feel? Is it just one of those Sunday school stories? Or is it something we experience in our life? Listen, if we need in our life a miracle, a miracle in our family, a miracle in our church, a miracle in our nation, a miracle in our world today, the first thing we need to do is to admit that we have a need to God. Would you agree with that? Because that's what the scriptures teach us. And that's what Jesus was teaching to the disciples. The second action that needs to take place is that we need to assess. Debit card's empty, my pockets only have fluff. Seriously. We need to take an inventory of what it is that we have. We need to ask ourselves, what do I have and how am I using it? This is exactly what Jesus asked the disciples to do. Look at verse 38. Jesus said to them, how many loaves of bread do you have? Go and see. When they knew, they said, oh, 
five loaves of bread and two fish. See, so why did Jesus do that? He's God. He already knew how much they had, right? But even if he didn't, couldn't he have just made bread fall down from heaven? Like, couldn't he have just taken stones and turned them into bread and some meat? Why would Jesus ask them to go and see what they already had? See, God always starts with what we have. Remember Moses in the desert in Exodus chapter 4? He said to Moses, he said, what do you have in your hand? Moses said, it's a stick, it's my stick, and it's my stick. It's a shepherd's staff, I need it. Listen, we not only need to tell God what our need is, but we need to tell him what we have. Be blunt. And if all you've got is your hands, because you just don't have any money left, then tell him, God, I've got my hand. If all of you that you've got is your ability to drive someone to and from church or to and from a doctor's appointment because you just don't have anything else, you say, God, well, that I, I can do that. You see, God doesn't want an audience. What, what he wants is a player. He doesn't want us to be a spectator in what he's doing. He wants a partner in his ministry. He wants our strength. He wants our gifts. He wants our faith. But he wants what we have, not what we think we don't have. And if all you've got is pocket fluff, just maybe he can knit a sweater. In verse 36, Jesus says to the disciples, you give them something to eat. You feed them. How would you like to be one of the disciples there? 15,000 people against 12. The 12 are supposed to feed them. There's 15,000 people. And the disciples say, you feed them. So the disciples responded exactly probably how I would have responded. Lord, this is impossible. It's humanly impossible. It's financially impossible. It's practically impossible. We cannot do this. Question, has God ever asked you to do something that's impossible? I'm going to give you the answer before you decide to answer it and say that no, because the answer is yes. But maybe we've just pretended the problem went away. Maybe we've procrastinated so long we've forgotten what the real problem was. Is he asking you, is he asking me to do something that seems impossible even now? Now, listen, God moves in the things that we think are impossible. He loves impossible odds because impossible odds are what sets the stage for him to do amazing things. Amazing miracles. And they happen so that his glory would be revealed. Think about it. God saves a family from... a flood and destroys the whole world. Yeah. The river parts and millions cross over on dry land. He protected Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, didn't he, from the fiery furnace? Well, what about Gideon? With only 300 men, they took on 30,000 men. And he delivered the people because Esther was willing to walk down the hallway that could have led to a disaster. And God got all the glory. Because the victory defies all odds. So often our prayers revolve around asking God to reduce the odds in our lives. We want everything to be in our favor. But maybe God allows the difficult odds to stack against us so that you and I can witness that God is able. Maybe faith is trusting God no matter how impossible the odds are. Maybe our impossible situation are really God-ordained moments. For us to be able to experience the riches of his love and his glory and his power. Listen, when I read the book, 
time after time, I see God asking his people to do very big things with very little because he wants us to freak out. No, of course not. Oh, because he wants us to worry and panic. No, it's not that. God wants our faith seed, as tiny as it may be. Because he wants us to grow. John 6, 6 says this. It says that Jesus was testing them because he already knew what he was going to do. Jesus wasn't worried. He wasn't afraid. He wasn't freaked out. He saw the need of the crowd long before the disciples realized it. And in fact, maybe when the scriptures say that he had compassion on them, he already knew he was going to provide food for them. He already had a plan. Listen, there's a big truth here that we here at Christian Baptist Church need to grab a hold of, and you read it. And just to scare you a little bit, you're probably a lot more like me than you want to admit. We're going to face some really big problems, especially as the days come ahead in this world and in ministering right here on Main Street. Problems that will kick the snot out of us. Sorry, that may have been a little too strong. He'll knock, knock the wind out of our sails. sails. But don't forget this fact. That Jesus will never be taken off guard. Jesus won't be pacing the streets of heaven going, oh, angels, can you figure something out to do? Because I'm not sure what we're going to do. How are we going to meet the problem with those people down at Christian Baptist Church? There's so many heathen people there. Oh, I don't know what we're going to do. There's only 39 people that show up at best. What are we going to do? Just like feeding 5,000 hungry men. Amen. Jesus knows what he's going to do. He knows what he's going to do. Before we're aware that we even have a need. Did anyone hear that? Or have I just put everybody to sleep? See, Almighty God is never taken by surprise. He's all-knowing. He sees the beginning, he sees the now, and he sees the end of the story because we're partners with him in his story. He's not partnering with us in our story. Do you get that? This is not about you and me. This is about him and his glory. He won't be surprised at what we've given. He won't be surprised at what we place before him. He won't be surprised that we have a problem that's way bigger than we want to share with the person that's sitting a couple of rows ahead of us or behind us. He'll be waiting. He'll be waiting. For us to take action, we have to admit that we have a need and we have to show him what we have. Not because he doesn't know, but because he wants your willingness. The third action that we need to take is to give God what we have. Oh boy, I knew that was coming. That's not even fair, Andrew. Okay, I'm willing to show him what I have, but it's mine. Just like Moses' staff was his. Just like the five smooth stones were David's. Just like the cheese sandwich that he brought down to, to go and see what his brothers were doing with the battle against that Philistine. They were his. The Gospel of John. One of the disciples found this kid. And he brought his lunch pail with him. Five barley loaves and two small fish, probably dried sardines. Now likely in a crowd of 5,000 men, there was probably someone else that packed a 
bag lunch for her husband. Okay, there was probably someone else. There was probably someone else that may have actually brought a little bit more food than this kid's lunch pail. But this boy got to be hero not because he brought the best meal to the teaching, but he was willing to give what he had to God. Jesus, this is all I have, but you can have it. God will use whatever we give him. Now pay attention here. I did not say that God uses whatever we have. No, I said that God uses whatever we give him. And there's a huge difference between those two things. See, the Bible says that Jesus took the five loaves and the two fish and he gave thanks for them and he broke them and then he kept giving them to the disciples to set before the people. Hang on a second. What do you mean he kept giving them? What do you mean he kept on giving them? I know, you know the end of the story, but work with me here for a second. This is amazing. I don't know how he did it, but somehow every time he broke the bread, there was another piece of bread. Every time he broke the fish, there was another piece of sardine. Every single time he kept on doing it over and over and over and over again until everyone, the scripture says, was satisfied. But not just that, until there were leftovers. And it wasn't just a lunch pail. It was 12 baskets full of leftovers. Please listen, God will only use what we give him. It doesn't matter if it's just a little, but it does take faith. Faith as small as a young boy's lunch pail. Even a mustard seed of faith can accomplish great things when we give it to Jesus in faith. David had to step out in the valley to face Goliath. Moses had to throw down his staff at the burning bush. Noah had to go to Home Depot and pick up a few supplies. Abraham had to climb a mountain. Esther had to walk down that hallway. Every one of them had to give what they could do. Then God took what they gave. He blessed it and used it. And he accomplished miraculous things for his glory. See, I believe that God is calling you and me to, some, to take some God-ordained risks, and they are uncomfortable. And as I was preparing this message, some of the risks that God was putting on my heart for us as a congregation said, okay, God, look, look, we are only 39 people on our roster, and there's probably a few of them that we need to remove from the roster anyway. Like, we, we don't have God. I mean, okay, we got a couple of bucks in our bank account right now, but that's not going to last very long. God, have you not seen the things that we have to spend on, on repairs? Have you not seen the other things that we need to do? Listen. Wooden sticks like staves, five smooth stones, a few buns, and a couple of fish. It's all that was given to him. They have huge potential, even if we don't see that right now. Ordinary things from ordinary people placed into the hands of Jesus is nothing small. In fact, it's much. It's much. It's great in God's economy. We need to give willingly, cheerfully, and immediately while we have the opportunity. Because make no mistake, God will meet the need here on Main Street with or without you. And you could say, great, it's someone else's responsibility. And you miss out on everything that God had intended for you in your life. There's a fourth action, and I'm going too long, I'm sorry. Fourth action that we need to take to see a miracle in our life. So we've got to expect God to show up. Oh, maybe it's out of desperation. Maybe it's out of uh, need. But we, we've, got to, we've got to start expecting that God is going to do something. Expect God to multiply our offering because we can't. See, the, bear, the boy, he shared his two fish and his five buns. And verse 42 says, they ate and all of them were filled. 
And afterwards, his followers picked up 12 basketfuls full of bread and fish. See, when we give to God, he always gives us more. When we step out in faith, God always shows up and multiplies it. God, we need to ask him. He always starts with what it is that we have. And God uses whatever it is that we have. And whatever we give, he gives back to us more. My question is, what are we waiting for? You could say, well, that's a really good message, Andrew. I'm going to sit home and I'm going to think about it. And it's a really good thing. And hopefully next week, you won't give me a question where you have to, I have to give. Where I have to uh, open my wallet or where I have to give more of my time. I'm a busy guy. busy guy. Maybe next week, you'll smarten up and give us an easier message. Like maybe Jesus loves me. Oh, yeah. We did that one, didn't we? So back to the question, Matthew chapter 16. Jesus says, who do you say I am? Seriously, who do you say he is? I think it's time for us to cooperate with God. What about you? What about you? I think it's time for us to cooperate on a different level. Because as Paul said, the days are evil. And the time is at hand. I think it's time for us to cooperate or learn to re-cooperate with God. So that we can experience what only he can do. Let's pray. God, I tend to blabber on too long, and I'm sorry. But I hope somehow the word that you laid on my heart this week is a word for us today. And I pray, God, that we would be courageous. No. That we'd be scared to death enough to know that we don't have any help unless we come to you. And so we just begin admitting our need giving you what we have, trusting you to take it and use it so that you alone would get the glory. And whatever it is that you're calling us to today, whether it's something personal, individual in our own families, or maybe something way bigger. bigger. It just seems monstrous for us as a church. church. I pray that you'd give us courage to be able to step out in faith. And I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, before I go on any further, I just want to talk to you about what the Lord laid on my heart in this. I have been well, you know, for those of you who've joined us on Zoom Church over the past few months, past two years, we've had a family from Azerbaijan who have come to us really in desperate need. They need safety. They need a place. They've gone through every hoop that we've asked them to do. We've told them we can't help them unless they become refugees. We've told them all sorts of stuff. Some of us have given out of our own bank account. Some of us have given, we have some money from the church to be able to help them in time of need. They live on the doorstep of what's happening in Ukraine. Like on the doorstep of it. Okay, sure, it's about 400 miles away. But I want to let you know something. 400 miles is a doorstep to a nuclear bomb. It's, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's a step for a misguided missile. 
And, and, and so they, because we haven't been able to help them come here, they went and they've gone and looked at other churches online trying to beg that someone else might have compassion on them. And, and so they attended a church and answered seven or eight families over the last number of years. And the church came to them and said, no, we can't do it. We, there's nothing. But don't worry, we're going to pray for you. And then they went to another church who, remarkably weird as anything like this, the senior pastor of the church happened to be my son Wesley's basketball coach. We got like 900 people in the church. Count how many more that is than what we have. And we're the only church that gave them anything. These other two churches, the 500 in Edmonton and the 900 in Abbotsford, BC, they gave them nothing, but they prayed for them. And they promised to keep them on their prayer list. And all that Kelly would really like right now, while they wait to find somebody, some homeschooling material so they could teach their kids because they can't go to school. We think it's been bad here for two years. Andrew, don't do it. Don't go out and get the, the offering plate and pass it out because we can't do it. We're, we're 39 people. We can't sponsor someone. You're right, we can't. But what we can do is put before God their need, admit to them there's a problem. We can't feed them. We can't clothe them. We can't house them. We can't bring them here. How many of you say that that's not true? It's true, right? We can admit it. Then we can lay before them what we have. God, we, we could provide homeschooling materials to them. To them. We could. I mean, I, I, I spoke to Stephen about this back over a year ago. They were asking for just a little bit of help. They just need $300 a month to be able to pay for their, their rent in the place that they're in. And fortunately, Ken's hasn't gotten arrested in Azerbaijan because he's been working under the table to be able to at least pay their rent. Because that's all he can do. Well, actually, what he could do is go to the Lord and ask, ask some church in Newmarket with 39 people who are just meeting on Zoom, and now we get to meet together. And, and Listen, I'm not trying to put a guilt trip on you. I'm just telling you, this is what God's put on my heart. We think we can't, but what has God said he can do? Would you just admit you've got a problem and then give me what you've got and then let me multiply it and let me get the glory? I know. Not fair. You didn't come here for that this morning. this morning. But just maybe God's speaking to one of you. Maybe he's speaking to us. Because there's a whole lot of other things that we could be doing right here on Main Street, but we're too busy. We don't have enough. We have our own stuff. What can we do? We can start by admitting we have a problem. Start by admitting we have a problem and then give them what we have. Give them what he's telling us to give them. So I have 320 bucks that I've been kind of saving for something else. But this morning... I'm not asking you to do anything. I'm just telling you that that's what God's put on my heart. So I just lay that out. Because when we give him, when we admit our problem, when we give him what we have, after doing a proper inventory, and we let him do what only he can do, 
our miracle working God continues to do that. And just because I'm not sure how the electronics is going to work for our song here, can we just sing? This, this, how great is our God. Sing with me, how great is our God. That all will see how great, how great is our God. How great is our God. Sing with me, how great is our God, that all will see, see how great, how great is our God, then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, Great thou art, then sings my soul. My Savior God to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art. See, Jesus was with them. He's with us. So what will we do? I'm going to change the way we end here today. We had a really good time in our annual meeting. And for those of you who were able to join us on Tuesday night, thank you. God bless you. It was great. It was exciting to hear some of the pictures and the enjoyment that people were having about dreaming what God might do for us and through us right here on Main Street. And those are great, and they're big. And if we think big in faith, God will stretch us, and it might be amazing what he might do in the midst of us. Um, and every week we talk about, uh, at the end of the service, our, our needs for the porch pantry. And I know that we need some soup and some stuff. There are some food needs that we have right now. Um, our freezer's almost full of food right now, which is awesome. It's, it's terrific. But our pantry is running a little bit low. So if you guys have that on your heart this week, then it would be awesome that you could help us provide for the needs of those who are hungry here on the street. George serves in the porch, or sorry, at the Annex Cafe every Wednesday, and he's been doing it quietly. Most of you don't know anything about what he did. Russ, you helped out for so long with him as well uh, throughout the summer months and Prior to that, uh, Chris Craig, who helped. Um, George is really going to be tied up over the next few weeks as he prepares to sell their home with Janice and move. Uh, not sell their house, but pack up and leave and move to another place that they're going to be renting. Um, maybe there's just someone who could step up and lend a hand on Wednesday mornings. I'm sure that George could, could teach you. It's not very difficult. Even I learned how to make coffee. Although maybe Rhonda's not listening here and hopefully she couldn't find out that I know how to make coffee. But that's a real need. And George needs someone on Wednesday mornings to help, especially over that period of time. And there are other things that we have in front of us. And just maybe God's speaking to one of you. Maybe he's speaking to me. And who knows, maybe after today, I'm going to get fired. I don't think so, but that's okay, because maybe God will free up my time to be able to do that. <laughs> but I'm just asking you this one question as we close. We normally stop in prayer, but I would like to do this in a very different way as we close. And the uh, newsletter for that. That microphone is open. Um, yeah. And I dare you. I dare you to come up 
and present our need to God. One, two, three, whatever it is. I dare you to be honest and tell them what we don't have. And then say, God, you're, you alone can help. help. So let's just take a few minutes. I know we're already 15 minutes late. It's something, a car race or something on TV. But uh, I'm going to invite you to pray. And then when it seems appropriate, I'll close. Let's pray. Oh, and Zoom people, please feel free to unmute yourself and pray as well. Hello. Um, I've had a thing on my heart for a while. So we could use the annex uh, to teach people how to use computers. I'm going to school for computers and I have a small business and I'm willing to give my time to teach people stuff and the money from it can go towards Christian Baptist Church. Um, being allowed to use the annex and uh, an okay from the pastor. Just a thought, something I can do. I don't have a whole lot of money, but I do have skills and talents, and I'm willing to give that. I want to give the prayer um, and I want to give thanks for this, this body of people, believers, and uh, the encouragement and instructions from Andrew this morning. We need to give uh, the morning last year. When, when I was baptized, I just, I remember saying, I surrender all. Not what I can, not what's left in my pockets, all. We need to give it all. I want to pray for George to help teach me make coffee since I will be busy Wednesday mornings. Thank you. <clears throat> Lord God, we... Uh we come to you with our, um, our Main Street ministry. We, we know we're here uh, on Main Street to serve the needy, um, serve those around us that need, that need you and need our help. Um, Lord, we, um, we know that, that um, we, we hear you telling us to keep growing that ministry, Lord. And maybe we can do more than just coffee <clears throat> on a Wednesday morning. Um, as more and more people come to our door for food, how do we keep meeting those needs, Lord? So we're, we're few, um, and we know we... Know we We're hearing you tell us to use our building cane, um, so we um, we have a little, um, and uh, and we give it to you, um, mm -hmm. and we ask you to multiply it as we um, as we uh, as we continue to serve on Main Street. Yes, um, and we know that those expenses are going to continue to increase, 
um, and we don't know where that extra money is going to come from, Laura, but please multiply what we have. Yes, sir. I want to be grateful to God for having me in Christian Baptist Church. And I want I want Christian Baptist Church to also pray for the people in Liberia here, West Africa. And I also pray that uh, one day Christian Baptist Church should come to Liberia so that they can serve the people and God as well in Liberia. Thank you. Now unto you who is able to present us faultless before the presence of your glory with exceeding great joy. To the only wise God, our Savior, be glory, dominion, power, authority, authority, both now now in our need, and until that day when we see you face to face and lay down the crown that you give us because you alone are worthy. To you deserve all the praise. Amen. Church, I leave these words. Do not come back to play church. Don't come another Sunday If all you want to do, I mean, you won't, because after today, you're going to be going, I'm not going back there anymore. But don't do it, because the world out there is the ones that need the church. We come in to learn, to be taught, and to go out powerful. Don't leave here weak. Go in the strength of God. God bless you, church. <laughs>